I'm Brother Bobby from Vancouver, Canada. Our people wish you and your family immense blessings and grace. In today's episode, entitled The Baha'i Faiths Gems of Divine Mysteries, paragraph 63 to 76, let's explore the profound teaching of the Baha'i Faith. Baha'u'llah was the founder of the Baha'i Faith. He and his teachings are believed to be prophesied in Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and other religions. Baha'u'llah was born in 1817 in Tehran, Persia, in present-day Iran. The word Baha means glory or splendor. The Baha'i Faith rests on three core principles, unity of God, unity of religion, and unity of humankind. Approximately 7 million people today in many countries adhere to the Baha'i Faith. Their scriptures are translated into 800 languages, and there are houses of worship in just about every corner of the world. Baha'i principles envision an ideal society. They are gender equality, elimination of all forms of prejudice, whether religious, racial, class, or national, harmony of religion and science, universal opportunity of education for all, a universal auxiliary language which all humanity can use to cooperate quickly with one another, a judicious world government, and the elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. Many people like the Baha'i followers see a noble society as a real goal to be pursued in everyday life. Today, we present the sage wisdom of Baha'u'llah with excerpts from the holy book, Gems of Divine Mysteries. The essence of the divine mysteries in the journeys of ascent set forth for those who long to draw nigh unto God, the Almighty, the Ever-Forgiving. Blessed be the righteous that quaff from these crystal streams. He is the exalted, the Most High. At this hour, when the sweet savors of attraction have wafted over me from the everlasting city, when transports of yearning have seized me from the land of splendors, at the dawning of the day star of the worlds, above the horizon of Iraq, and the sweet melodies of Hejaz have brought to mine ears the mysteries of separation. I have purposed to relate unto thine eminence a portion of that which the mystic dove hath warbled in the midmost heart of paradise as to the true meaning of life and death, though the task be impossible. For were I to interpret these words for thee, as it hath been inscribed in the guarded tablets, all the books and the pages of the world could not contain it, nor could the souls of men bear its weight. I shall nonetheless mention that which beseemeth this day and age, that it might serve as a guidance unto whosoever desireth to gain admittance into the retreats of glory in the realms above to hearken unto the melodies of the Spirit intoned by this divine and mystic bird, and to be numbered with those who have severed themselves from all save God, and who in this day rejoice in the presence of their Lord. Know then that life hath a twofold meaning. The first pertaineth to the appearance of man in an elemental body, and is as manifest to thine eminence and to others as the midday sun. This life cometh to an end with physical death, which is a God-ordained and inescapable reality. That life, however, which is mentioned in the books of the prophets and the chosen ones of God, is the life of knowledge, that is to say, the servant's recognition of the sign of the splendors wherewith he who is the source of all splendor hath himself invested him, and his certitude of attaining unto the presence of God through the manifestation of his cause. 
This is that blessed and everlasting life that perisheth not. Whosoever is quickened thereby shall never die, but will endure as long as his Lord and Creator will endure. The first life which pertaineth to the elemental body will come to an end, as hath been revealed by God. Every soul shall taste of death. But the second life, which ariseth from the knowledge of God, knoweth no death, as hath been revealed aforetime. Him will be surely quicken to a blessed life. And in another passage concerning the martyrs, nay, they are alive and sustained by their Lord. And from the traditions, he who is a true believer liveth both in this world and in the world to come. Numerous examples of similar words are to be found in the books of God and of the embodiments of His justice. For the sake of brevity, however, we have contented ourselves with the above passages. O oh, my brother, forsake thine own desires, turn thy face unto thy Lord, and walk not in the footsteps of those who have taken their corrupt inclinations for their God that perchance thou mayest find shelter in the heart of existence, beneath the redeeming shadow of him who traineth all names and attributes. For they who turn away from their Lord in this day are in truth accounted amongst the dead, though to outward seeming they may walk upon the earth, amongst the deaf, though they may hear, amongst the blind, though they may see, as hath been clearly stated by him who is the Lord of the day of reckoning. Hearts have they, with which they understand not, and eyes have they, with which they see not. They walk the edge of a treacherous bank, and tread the brink of a fiery abyss. They partake not of the billows of this surging and treasure-laden ocean, but disport themselves with their own idle words. In this connection, we will relate unto thee that which was revealed of old concerning life, that perchance it may turn thee away from the promptings of self, deliver thee from the narrow confines of thy prison in this gloomy plain, and aid thee to become of them that are guided aright in the darkness of this world. He saith, and he verily speaketh the truth. Shall the dead whom we have quickened, and for whom we have ordained a light, whereby he may walk amongst men, be like him whose likeness is in the darkness, whence he will not come forth? This verse was revealed with respect to Hamze and Abu Jah, the former of whom was a believer, whilst the latter disbelieved. Most of the pagan leaders mocked and derided it, were agitated and clamored. How did Hamza die, and how was he restored to his former life? Were ye to examine carefully the verses of God, ye would find many such statements recorded in the book. Would that pure and stainless hearts could be found, that I might impart unto them a sprinkling from the oceans of knowledge which my Lord hath bestowed upon me, so that they may soar in the heavens even as they walk upon the earth, and speed over the waters even as they course the land, and that they may take up their souls in their hands and lay them down in the path of their Creator. Howbeit, leave hath not been granted to divulge this mighty secret, Indeed, it hath been from everlasting a mystery enshrined within the treasuries of his power, and a secret concealed within the repositories of his might, lest his faithful servants forsake their own lives in the hope of attaining this most great station in the realms of eternity. Nor shall they who wander in this oppressive darkness ever attain unto it. O oh, my brother, 
At every juncture we have restated our theme, that all that hath been recorded in these verses may, by the leave of God, be made clear unto thee, and that thou mayest become independent of those who are plunged in the darkness of self, and who tread the valley of arrogance and pride, and be of them that move within the paradise of everlasting life. Say, O people, the tree of life hath verily been planted in the heart of the heavenly paradise, and bestoweth life in every direction. How can ye fail to perceive and recognize it? It will in truth aid thee to grasp all that this well-assured soul hath disclosed unto thee of the essence of the divine mysteries. The dove of holiness warbleth in the heaven of immortality, and admonisheth thee to array thyself with a new vesture, wrought of steel to shield thee from the shafts of doubt concealed in the allusions of men, saying, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, He must be born again. Wing then thy flight unto this divine tree, and partake of its fruits. Gather up that which hath fallen therefrom, and guard it faithfully. Meditate then upon the utterance of one of the prophets as he intimated to the souls of men through veiled illusions and hidden symbols, the glad tidings of the one who is to come after him, that thou mayest know of a certainty that their words are inscrutable to all save those who are endued with an understanding heart. He saith, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and brass-like were his feet, and out of his mouth goeth a two-edged sword. How could these words be literally interpreted? Were any one to appear with all these signs, he would assuredly not be human. And how could any soul seek his company? Nay, should he appear in one city, even the inhabitants of the next would flee from him, nor would any soul dare approach him. Yet, shouldst thou reflect upon these statements, thou wouldst find them to be of such surpassing eloquence and clarity as to mark the loftiest heights of utterance and the epitome of wisdom. Methinks it is from them that the sons of eloquence have appeared, and the stars of clarity have dawned forth and shone resplendent. Behold, then, the foolish ones of bygone times, and those who in this day await the advent of such a being. Nor would they ever bear allegiance unto him, except that he appear in the aforementioned form and as such a being will never appear, so too will they never believe. Such indeed is the measure of the understanding of these perverse and ungodly souls. How could those who fail to understand the most evident of the evident and the most manifest of the manifest ever apprehend the abstruse realities of the divine precepts and the essence of the mysteries of his everlasting wisdom. I shall now briefly explain the true meaning of this utterance, that thou mayest discover its hidden mysteries, and be of them that perceive. Examine then, and judge aright, that which we shall reveal unto thee, that haply thou mayest be accounted in the sight of God amongst those who are fair-minded, in these matters. Know then that he who uttered these words in the realms of glory meant to describe the attributes of the one who is to come in such veiled and enigmatic terms as to elude the understanding of the people of error. Now when he saith his eyes were as a flame of fire, he alludeth but to the keenness of sight and acuteness of vision of the Promised One, 
who with his eyes burneth away every veil and covering, maketh known the eternal mysteries in the contingent world, and distinguisheth the faces that are obscured with the dust of hell from those that shine with the light of paradise. Were his eyes not made of the blazing fire of God, how could he consume every veil and burn away all that the people possess? How could he behold the signs of God in the kingdom of his names and in the world of creation? How could he see all things with the all-perceiving eye of God? Thus have we conferred upon him a penetrating vision in this day. Would that ye believe in the verses of God! For indeed, what fire is fiercer than this flame that shineth in the sinai of his eyes, whereby he consumeth all that have veiled the peoples of the world? Immeasurably exalted shall God remain above all that hath been revealed in his unerring tablets concerning the mysteries of the beginning and the end, until that day when the crier will cry out, The day whereon we shall all return unto him. As to the words, brass-like were his feet, by this is meant his constancy upon hearing the call of God that commandeth him, Be thou steadfast, as thou hast been bidden. He shall so persevere in the cause of God, and evince such firmness in the path of his might, that even if all the powers of earth and heaven were to deny him, he would not waver in the proclamation of his cause, nor flee from his command in the promulgation of his laws. Nay, rather, he will stand as firm as the highest mountains and the loftiest peaks. He will remain immovable in his obedience to God, and steadfast in revealing his cause and proclaiming his word. No obstacle will hinder him, nor will the censure of the foreword deter him, or the repudiation of the unbelievers cause him to waver. All the hatred, the rejection, the iniquity, and the unbelief that he witnesseth serve but to strengthen his love for God, to augment the yearning of his heart to heighten the exaltation of his soul, and to fill his breast with passionate devotion. Hast thou ever seen in this world brass stronger, or blade sharper, or mountain more unyielding than this? He shall verily stand upon his feet to confront all the inhabitants of the earth, and will fear no one, notwithstanding that which, as thou well knowest, the people are wont to commit. Glory be to God, who hath established him and called him forth. Potent is God to do what he pleaseth. He, in truth, is the help in peril, the self-subsisting. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Baha'i Faith's Gems of Divine Mysteries, paragraph 63 to 76, on Words of Wisdom. Coming up next is Super Speed Transports, The Future of Travel, Part 1 of 2. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. May Divine Providence endow your life with bliss, joy, and immense love. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash w-o-w.